So this clip circulated on my Discord server recently. A lot of people were really unhappy about it. If a woman has obesity and diabetes, she has quadruple the risk of having an autistic child. It's from the podcast Diary of a CEO with Stephen Bartlett. The podcast with the thumbnails, even if you haven't watched it, you probably recognize the thumbnails that I feel like every podcast is trying to emulate nowadays. But he interviewed Dr. Chris Palmer, who is a psychiatrist. He works at Harvard and he's recently been doing the rounds on a lot of different channels and podcasts to promote his book, Brain Energy. The book that will forever change how we understand and treat mental health, apparently. So Chris Palmer is very keen on the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet is a highly restricted diet where people consume a lot of fats. Most of your calories are coming from fats. You get adequate protein and then it's very, very low carbohydrate. So mostly what you're eating is meat and cheese and cream and avocados. And then when you eat this way, you go into a state called ketosis. So your brain and body is running on fat. Unbeknownst to most people, the ketogenic diet was developed over a hundred years ago now by a physician for one and only one purpose. It was developed to stop seizures. And it's true, the ketogenic diet is a somewhat evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. Epilepsy.org.uk says, so far there has been more research into the use of ketogenic diets for children than for adults. Some studies have shown that about half of children will have a good response to the ketogenic diet and some will become seizure-free. However, the ketogenic diet does not work for everyone and it is not possible to predict who it will help. More high quality research is needed to find out how well these diets work in treating epilepsy. So because there is some success in treating epilepsy with a ketogenic diet, Chris Palmer then takes this one step further. He goes, well, it works for epilepsy and sometimes epilepsy medications are used to treat mental illnesses or used in psychiatry. So maybe the ketogenic diet would work to cure mental illnesses. And for him, this potentially extends to neurodevelopmental conditions such as autism and ADHD as well. The podcast they did together was almost two hours. I'm gonna be responding to this nine minute clip that was uploaded on their Diary of a CEO's Clips channel. The title of that video was Dr. Chris Palmer's Brutally Honest Opinion on ADHD and Autism. Let's go, let's have a look. Let's see what the brutally honest opinions are. Are we ready? I don't think I'm ready. I've had so many parents message me about autism and ADHD. So many, you know, I've had so many concerned parents message me specifically on Instagram saying, please, Steve, I've had a child diagnosed with um, autism. They're trying to understand it. They're trying to get good information on it. Okay, first of all, why are people coming to Stephen Bartlett for advice on autism. Am I missing something here? It's a bit worrying. I mean, I know post-diagnosis support is not that good. Often it's diagnosis for both children and adults, diagnosis, and then poop, on your way, good luck. God bless you on your journey. But still, why is Steve the place to turn? I'm not quite sure. Is it because he wrote a book called Happy Sexy Millionaire? Is it because he accompanied Prince William on a royal trip to Bournemouth? Is it because he attended one lecture at Manchester Met? I can't really say anything about that. I am yet to finish a degree. We're the same, me and Steve. But yeah, I wouldn't say an entrepreneur's Instagram DMs would be the first place I would personally turn to if I was concerned about my child. Perhaps he means that people have been requesting that he brings on some guests on the podcast who are experts in autism, which I suppose is what he's trying to do here. Let's see if Dr. Chris Palmer has any good information. Okay, before we see what he has to say, the unpacking of today's conversation was brought to you by CyberGhost VPN, the VPN with the world's cutest logo. So VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. CyberGhost helps to protect your data by keeping you private and anonymous online. With CyberGhost, all your traffic goes through a secure VPN tunnel. Your IP address is hidden and your data is encrypted. And they also have a strict no locks policy, so CyberGhost isn't tracking your activity either. Using CyberGhost VPN, you can access geo-restricted content from websites including YouTube, social media networks, you can find better deals online, you can play games blocked in your region, and even get blocked libraries of over 40 streaming services. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, and many more. CyberGhost VPN is available for all platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and many others. You can use one subscription on seven devices at a time so you can share it with your family. They have over 38 million users and an excellent rating on Trustpilot where they've been reviewed by over 20,000 users. If you click my link in the description and
and pinned comment, you can access their service for $2.03 per month, plus four months free, which is 84% off. They have a 45 day money back guarantee, so there's nothing to lose. You've used the word autism and ADHD as we've been speaking about metabolism. What is the link in your view? Everything. The link is everything. I think if any doctor says anything about a theory with that much certainty, you should run. <laughs> run fast. No matter how promising it seems, the link is everything. Everything is a very, very strong word. I had a look at this like, signs your doctor is a quack thing on Huffington Post. And yeah, one of the red flags if your doctor speaks in absolutes. The link is everything. So the Really? The mitochondrial theory of autism actually was first proposed in 1985. And since then, we have had an explosion of research linking mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction to autism specifically. So Chris Palmer thinks potentially all mental illnesses and some physical health conditions too are caused by mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, gives cells energy. He basically thinks this might be the root of all what he considers disease and the main solution he offers for this is the ketogenic diet. So it does seem like there might be some sort of association. The idea was first suggested in 1985. It was after a pair of researchers looked at four autistic individuals who had a sign of mitochondrial disease. They put forward the possibility that some autistic people might have inborn errors of carbohydrate metabolism. But he is right that some studies have linked mitochondrial dysfunction to autism specifically. I looked at a 2012 meta-analysis and systematic review, which concluded that a relatively high number of autistic children, around 5%, had mitochondrial dysfunction, but they couldn't say if that was the cause of autism or whether that was just a secondary factor. At this point, it's not clear if mitochondrial dysfunction contributes to the development or pathogenesis of ASD, or if it's merely an epiphenomenon of ASD. And a 2020 review concluded ASD appears to be associated with novel types of mitochondrial abnormalities which are just beginning to be understood and the genetic mechanisms which drive these abnormalities are still very unclear. The link is everything. So no, I don't think we are in any place by any stretch of the imagination to say with any certainty that mitochondrial dysfunction is everything when it comes to autism. As they always say, correlation is not causation. I read a 2021 article discussing recent research in this area. Despite Despite such findings, even some mitochondria researchers are hesitant to causally link mitochondria and autism. The mitochondria an adult or child has are not necessarily the same as those she had in the womb when autism is thought to develop. So just because a lot of autistic people have one particular thing does not mean that it is the reason that they are autistic, obviously. As I've mentioned to you, the rates of autism have gone through the roof. In the United States, they've quadrupled in the last 20 years. So the CDC says currently one in 36 children are autistic. A UK study that I looked at recently for another video suggested one in 34 people might be autistic and that maybe half of all autistic people in the UK are currently undiagnosed. But in the year 2000, autism prevalence was thought to be one in 150. But you gotta remember in 1966, we thought the prevalence was 4.5 in 10,000. So, you know, the data changes to reflect the new information that we gain about the autisms. But yeah, you can twist those numbers and make them seem really scary if you want to. Look, it's on the rise. We have an autism epidemic. This is something that Autism Speaks kind of do on their website, which I don't really like. They have this very negative autism statistics and facts page. And on there they say one in 36 children have autism up from the previous one in 44. So there's like this implication that it is on the rise, it is a problem that is getting worse, which is definitely the message they tried to push in their very controversial 2009 advert, I am autism. I am autism. Your neighbors are happier to pretend that I don't exist, of course, until it's their child. I feel like I'm mentioning this in every single video, but it's a gem. It's this quality, quality cinema. The whole page is quite negative. It includes a breakdown of costs of autism services. I would just appreciate, you know, even if all these things are true, these pixelated facts you have up there, I'd appreciate a little sentence of like, but it doesn't have to be this way. Work with us and we'll try and improve the lives of autistic people, you know? It doesn't have to necessarily end on a bleak note. But I suppose writing in this way and autism is on the rise, it's coming for your children. Maybe that helps to bring the donor 
explanations and, and perhaps it works quite well for Chris Palmer's career too. So why is autism on the op? Well, there could be some environmental factors involved, but what we know for sure is that there is more awareness, more understanding of autism, and we're getting better at diagnosing it. In the past, autistic people who weren't classified as having a learning disability is what we'd call it in the UK. If you're in the US, you call it an intellectual disability, would often slip through the cracks and go through life unsupported. Those children who make up two thirds of autistic people are finally getting a diagnosis. This is crazy to me, but I suppose it makes sense. A 2021 study found that children in affluent areas were 80% more likely to get an autism diagnosis and black children were 30% less likely to get a diagnosis. Prevalence estimates are likely to continue to rise as disparities are reduced. We're also noticing that the gender ratios are shifting and more girls are being diagnosed. This is a good thing. I was diagnosed in my mid twenties. I absolutely wish I had been diagnosed way earlier. I try not to think about it too much, but I needed that diagnosis. Please let's not turn something positive. More children getting the recognition and the help that they need, the help that I wish I had had. Let's not turn that into something big and scary. In the United States, they've quadrupled in the last 20 years. And people think, well, what does that have to do with diet? Those kids haven't eaten a diet yet. Well, their parents have. I'm not sure if he's trying to imply that our parents weren't keto. And that's why we are autistic now. It's not like historically a load of people have been keto. But yes, he is not the first and he most certainly will not be the last person to claim that autism is caused by or could be cured by diet. Just in the last few months, I've seen content, some of it's not recent content, but I've seen content talking about how dairy causes autism, how gluten causes autism, how autism can be cured by going carnivore, by going raw vegan, by going high carb vegan. As the National Health Service in the UK states, autism is not caused by vaccines, by bad parenting, or by diet. If he's implying that keto is the answer, we certainly do not have enough research to back that up. And let me share a couple of statistics. So people are scratching their heads. Where's all this autism coming from? I thought autism was genetic. As a psychiatrist, I imagine he probably knows that we're not exactly scratching our heads. Yes, autism is genetic. Since the first autism twin study in 1977, several teams have compared autism rates in twins and shown that autism is highly heritable. Genetics might not explain everything and there are environmental factors which are linked to autism in some way, but it's thought that maybe these just work with the genetic factors. And if autism is genetic, it shouldn't quadruple in 20 years. Quadrupling in 20 years means something in the environment is causing it. Does it? Why? We know the rates of diagnosis are increasing. That doesn't necessarily mean the rate of autism is increasing. The first person to be diagnosed autistic died last year. We haven't even had the language to describe autism for that long. To provide just one piece of evidence to support what I'm saying, if a woman has obesity, she has double the risk of having an autistic child. If a woman has diabetes, she has double the risk of having an autistic child. If a woman has both obesity and diabetes, she has quadruple the risk of having an autistic child. If a man is obese, he has double the risk of having an autistic child. Again, very fear-mongering vibes here that make me uncomfortable. Very autism is a disease and it's coming for you and your child. I'm sure many of you, as I feel inclined to, again, it would only be anecdotal, but I'm sure you feel compelled to say, well, my parents didn't have obesity or diabetes and I'm still autistic, but there does seem to be a link in obesity and being overweight and autism. And there is also a link with a father having a higher BMI and having an autistic child. But researchers think these factors are unlikely to cause autism alone. Because a father's weight does not directly affect fetal development, the findings hint that any contribution from his BMI is genetic. The risk from the mother could be partly genetic as well. This provides substantial evidence that at least some of the association between maternal BMI and children's risk, risk in quotation marks, of autism stems from genetic factors that are associated with both BMI 
and risk for autism. So maybe there's just a link between autism and having a higher BMI for some reason. With diabetes, there does seem to be a link again, but it's correlation, not causation again. We do not fully understand it. And that's why when you look up causes of autism, you tend to see, well, it's genetic and maybe environmental stuff, but we don't really know what shrug because we're not sure. So people are scratching their heads trying to figure out where is all this autism coming from? Well, look around in the population. Are the rates of obesity going up? Are the rates of diabetes going up? The answer is unequivocally yes. And that is a reflection. It's not about fat shaming. I don't want anybody to hear that and wag their finger at fat people and say, oh, you're causing autism because you're overeating. It's not that simple. That's not the way it goes. It's not that simple. Well, you certainly made it seem as if it was. I'm also uncomfortable with the fact that he brings up not wanting to fat shame, but then completely demonizes autism. He's happy to portray autism as this horrible disease that was caused by negative things in our environment or our bad habits. And I wonder if he stopped to think about how that might make autistic people and their families feel. People with obesity have a metabolic or mitochondrial problem. That is why they have obesity. Now that might be caused by the foods they're eating, but they don't know any better usually. They think it's just about calories. And what I'm here to say is no, there's more to food than just calories. It might be those chemicals in the food that you're eating or something else, or it might be chemicals in our environment. It might be pesticides or microplastics, the forever chemicals that are becoming more and more ubiquitous. All of these things disrupt metabolism metabolism and mitochondrial function. And so when I talk about obesity and diabetes, increasing risk for autism, it's not about fat shaming. It's about understanding. It's about understanding that the parents have a metabolic problem already. That means that they have a problem in their cells with their mitochondria, and they then pass those on to their children. And in some cases, it may not show itself immediately as obesity or diabetes. It might show itself as a brain condition. So we've hit a lot of like buzzwords, buzz phrases here. We've got pesticides. We've got chemicals in food. We've got microplastics. I can't really wrap my head around what's being said here. People have obesity not because they're eating too many calories, but actually he says it's because of mitochondrial dysfunction, but that mitochondrial dysfunction might be caused by the food they eat. I think that's what he's trying to say. I really don't think we have enough evidence to say that obesity is caused by a problem with our mitochondria. Isn't there a chance that obesity could cause mitochondrial dysfunction? I think he's just sticking with this one size fits all approach. Everything that's perceived wrong with human bodies and brains must be caused by this one thing, whether it's obesity, autism, schizophrenia. It's just a appealing way to package a message, I suppose, to the general public. It's black and white. It sounds scientific enough. And I'm sure it sells books. Because lots of other things can play a role. And if an obese woman, for instance, also has an infection during pregnancy, that's going to increase her risk for having an autistic child even more. So she couldn't help whether she got an infection or not. Tragically, we just had an epidemic called COVID. And the early signs are telling us that, in fact, neurodevelopmental disorders are going to increase as a result of that. Again, there does seem to be a link between maternal infection and autism. However, you can't just say things like this, that COVID is going to cause more autism. Where is your evidence for that? A fetal imaging study in Germany, for example, found age-appropriate brain development in babies of women who had mild or moderate COVID-19 during pregnancy and no differences from babies whose mothers had not been infected. And infants born in New York City from March to December 2020 to women who had mild or moderate COVID-19 showed no signs of delay in motor or social development. We already had a quadrupling of the rates of autism. We are likely to see even worse statistics 
going forward. I do feel concerned about autism being presented this way on this podcast as well. As a result of something that went wrong, something like a fever that maybe could have been prevented if the parents had been more careful. I do worry that pushing this information in this very grave and serious tone could make some parents of autistic children see them as damaged in some way. There was a healthy child there somewhere, but then this thing happened to them and made them how they are now. And maybe they might blame themselves and feel like it's their fault. There's one mother who posts a lot of content on social media. I don't personally feel very comfortable with making a whole account about your autistic child. The stuff that's posted on there is mostly positive, which I think is better than sharing negative stuff and sharing meltdowns and stuff like that, but still not my favorite thing on earth. And she does have one post where I think she has a picture or a video of her child as a baby and she's reflecting on how she's had these feelings of like, was it my fault? Did something happen to my child that made her this way? And I think she discussed in that post something about oxygen during labor and things like that. I just felt like, oh my gosh, I really hope you delete this and there is no trace of this on the internet by the time your child gets older, you know? Because I just think it could make a person feel really broken. Anyway, at least he didn't say the COVID vaccine <laughs> caused autism. The hope. The hope with that big smile, his eyes lit up, is the hope between the pages of your book by any chance. Is it if we understand that science? The scientists don't fully understand the science yet. We can do something about it now, today. So once again, he's speaking in absolutes. He's given us this big scary problem, but don't worry, he has the one true solution. If you understand, if you see signs of autism in your child. If you've seen signs of autism in your child, Get them assessed, get them a diagnosis if you can, so they can have accommodations in school. If you si see signs of metabolic or mental health conditions in your children, if we intervene early enough, we can probably do something about it. How? Number one, by recognizing the problem. And then two, for some people, it could be as simple as dietary interventions. I don't think I've ever had one health condition that doesn't have some sort of like really restricted diet connected to it as like one of the potential holistic treatment options with like terrible evidence on it. I don't know what it is with diet. I guess it's just easy for the average person to control. And when you're following the diet, it can give you a sense of control. I suppose compared to some medications, it might feel like the risks are pretty low, although some of these restrictive diets can be pretty dangerous. The ketogenic diet can actually lead to kidney stones. It can lead to increases in your LDL or your bad cholesterol. It can double your risk for heart disease and it can increase the risk of neural tube birth problems such as spina bifida or just hyper-focusing on good, clean living. So that means prioritizing sleep, little less screen time, little more human contact, purpose in life, you know. You have no purpose in life. That is why you're autistic. I'm not sure what he's trying to say here exactly. Is this his revolutionary cure for autism? Autistic people are more likely to suffer with mental health difficulties. So yeah, things like sleep probably are very important to us. I know that it can be really detrimental to me if I don't get enough sleep and I seem to need more sleep than some of the people around me for sure. But if I slept, and woke up feeling sprightly, I'd still be autistic. I might be a happier autistic person, but I would still be autistic. And that's the thing, autism isn't an illness and it doesn't have a cure. In 1993, Jim Sinclair published an article which said the following, autism is not an appendage. Autism isn't something a person has or a shell that a person is trapped inside. There is no normal child hidden behind the autism. Autism is a way of being. It is pervasive. It colors every experience, every sensation, perception, thought, emotion, and encounter, every aspect of existence. It is not possible to separate the autism from the person. And if it were possible, the person you'd have left would not be the same person you started with family connection no alcohol no alcohol no marijuana no cbd try to avoid pills for everything that ails you if avoid pills for everything sounds like dangerous advice particularly from a psychiatrist if your child's sleeping please try methods other than pills including melatonin and over-the-counter pills don't just whip out a pill melatonin is a hormone that our bodies naturally produce when it gets dark when it's time to go to sleep autistic children sometimes prescribed it 
because autistic people can struggle with going to sleep. It's currently nearly 2 a.m. Where's my melatonin? But yeah, you'd have to see a GP, at least in this country, you'd have to see a GP to be prescribed it. And I doubt any GP is going to give it to you unless they know that you've kind of tried a lot of other things first, like getting to bed at a set time every night. If you're going to say somebody should completely avoid something, people should completely avoid melatonin, you kind of have to explain why. You can't just say blanket, well, pills are bad because I said they're bad. At least try some other interventions, like let's get you off the screen two hours before bed. Let's develop a routine in our household that we're all going to wind down. We're all going to turn off the electronics. Sleep hygiene, as they call it, it is important. Having a routine, having time to relax before bed, not going on screens for maybe an hour before bedtime. None of these are things that I do. My sleep is not very hygienic. But yeah, none of those things. I'm going to cure autism, if that's what we're trying to suggest here. Maybe I'm going to read you a bedtime story, or we're going to play a game, or we're going to do something really boring that everybody's going to say, this is so boring, I'm getting sleepy. And I'm going to say, great. <laughs> you're, it's so boring that you're getting sleepy, that means you're going to go to sleep, because it's bedtime. You sleep that autism away. Good idea. I mean, as I say, it's great advice for maybe improving your mental health. A little bit. Again, I worry that there's a little bit of implied blame here. Remember, the NHS says autism is not caused by bad parenting. It maybe suggests like, oh, you're not putting your child to bed properly. Your house is too chaotic. And that's why your child is autistic. Chris, when people say to you, or when people say the re quite common rebuttal that the reason we're seeing this rise in mental health disorders is just because there's more of a conversation about it. So more people are stepping forward. We now have a word for it. So there's just more labeling and these mental health disorders like the ones you've named and even things like ADHD and autism. It's just because there's more conversation going on and these things aren't in fact increasing. Hey, look, maybe we should be coming to Stephen Bartlett for autism advice after all. No, this is his podcast and he has chosen to platform this guy, so perhaps not. That is a common argument. I would argue that it's like just putting your head in the sand. I thought he was going to seriously explain why he doesn't subscribe to this argument with some sort of evidence, but no, no. Just you have your head in the sand. Okay, then. It's just, it's wrong because I think it's wrong. The easiest place to get an accurate read on the true prevalence of mental illness, and not just the recognition of it, but the true prevalence of it, is to talk to school teachers who've been teaching for more than 30 years. Another Huffington Post sign that your doctor is a quack. They rely on single person testimonials, social media or TV endorsements rather than peer reviewed data. If you ask them, were you just not recognizing the children 30 years ago who are screaming and tantruming in your classroom? Were you just not recognizing the children who were melting down when they got bad grades and injuring themselves in class? Were you just not recognizing the level of despair that you and anxiety that you see in children? D did you just have your head in the sand back then? And now, since everybody's talking about it, you see those behaviors you see those symptoms, the school teachers and the guidance counselors will laugh at you and say, no, 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 something has happened. Again, with this language, which is designed to scare people. So something happened recently and before this thing happened, nobody used to misbehave. Is that what we're saying? This has very like kids these days sort of energy to it. This nostalgia for when you were younger and it was a better time and nobody was autistic or an ADHD. -er. I don't know about you, but I have heard stories of what older people in my life got up to when they were younger that shock me. When people didn't have screens, they didn't have mobile phones, had to entertain themselves with all sorts of shenanigans, you know? People were not angels. And if people did used to be better behaved, well, physical punishment was only outlawed in the UK in 1987. Personally, I don't want to bring back the cane to spank all those autistic and ADHD people. No. The thing is, people who were neurodivergent in the past, they would have just had to continue on without accommodations, probably feeling stupid and picking up other labels for themselves along the way, like lazy. My mom's only realized that she's probably dyslexic in adulthood. Her school experience wasn't particularly pleasant. She was made to feel dumb. She was put into the F class because her classes were categorized 
categorized by grade. When I was growing up, I could never understand why she always called herself a stupid person because she has such a good vocabulary, she has such great opinions about things, she's an incredibly talented artist, but school made her feel really small. And she's realized as she's got older, she just really struggles with reading. And hopefully today, that would have been picked up. And a lot of people who are being diagnosed now who may have previously slipped through the cracks might have a more internalized presentation of autism or ADHD. Not everybody who is autistic and ADHD is gonna be like ripping up their school books, standing on the chair, stomping around. I'm not even sure how many people are doing those things. A child with ADHD might just daydream a lot and zone out and not finish their work on time. Neurodivergence doesn't mean constant meltdowns and meltdowns are a symptom of distress and if you can help that person to not get into the place of being distressed, there's a high chance they're not going to have the meltdown. But if we're doing anecdotes as Dr. Chris is, then my son's school class is wonderful. They're a lovely group of children, including all of the neurodivergent members of the class. Presenting neurodivergence in this way as if everybody's screaming and crying and banging on the windows is just harmful. But regardless, why are we asking teachers about their 30 year old, their stale experience. Surely as a psychiatrist, he can see, you know, if this was a study and he was asking the participants to recall how things were 30 years ago versus now, would he not agree that that would be a terrible, a crap piece of research? Recency bias as well. And say, no, 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 something has happened. Something horrible has happened. Really? Like one in 34 people or something horrible that has happened? Is Anthony Hopkins something horrible? Is Chloe Hayden something horrible? Is Jason Arde, who didn't speak until he was 11, who is the youngest black professor at Cambridge, is he something horrible that's happened? I wasn't ignoring mental health 30 years ago. I wasn't ignoring despair 30 years ago. I wasn't ignoring extreme anxiety and panic. So as somebody who wasn't diagnosed until my mid-twenties, I will agree that teachers didn't exactly ignore my needs. I would say some needs were accommodated. For example, I had a time where I just really could not cope with socializing at lunchtime, so I was allowed to go home for lunch. There were also some of my needs that just were not accommodated and I was shouted at for. For example, being terrible at sports. I now have a dyspraxia diagnosis, but at the time it was very much like I am misbehaving because I was so uncoordinated. It looked like I wasn't trying and it was just, you know, a behavioral problem. And then some things my mum was blamed for. For example, I had a few periods of school avoidance throughout my school experience and yeah, it was always her fault she wasn't disciplining me enough. Probably some people even listening to that now will be like, well, why couldn't you just make her go? Just make her go to school. She has to, <laughs> you know? The issues were all still there and some were dealt with better than others. I wasn't ignoring tantrums in my classroom 30 years ago. They are skyrocketing. It just paints this really bleak image, doesn't it? I just think if you're having that many autistic or whatever meltdowns in your class, you might wanna have a look at that class environment maybe. If you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy this one about how some autistic people don't really get on with parents of autistic children and why that is and is there anything that we can do to bridge the gap. If you'd like to support the creation of these videos at 2 a.m., you are very welcome to do so. I have a Patreon. The lowest tier is four US dollars a month and on that tier, you get access to the Discord server where you can chat to a lot of other very, very lovely neurodivergent people. And you'll also get two exclusive videos every month. It's a lot of exciting content coming up in the next few weeks, so hopefully you'll enjoy it all. And if you've been thinking you might like a VPN, click the link below to take advantage of CyberGhost's offer. They'll protect your data while you browse and give you full access to all blocked content on the internet for just $2.03 per month. As I say, they have a 45 day money back guarantee, so you might as well give it a go if you've been in the market for a VPN. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.